Hi, my name is Amanda. Welcome to Foundations Church. Here's some upcoming events we don't want you to miss out on. FC Women's Bible Study continues this Tuesday at 6.30 p.m. We are studying the book Perfectly Week by our very own Casey Graves. This is a great opportunity for you to get involved with what's happening in our women's ministry. You can find out more information on our FC Women's Facebook page. Hey Foundations, it's October, the month of cooler weather, pumpkin spice everything, and pastor appreciation. That's right, it's pastor appreciation month, and we know we have the best pastoral staff all around. Join us on Sunday, October 27th in all three services where we'll be receiving a special offering to show our pastors how much we love and appreciate them. So this October 27th, let's celebrate our pastors. FC Students is taking a mission trip to Arlington, Texas, March 15th through the 20th. We will be doing service projects, sharing the gospel, and working with the local community. If you would like more information, you can check out our website at foundationschurch.tv slash students, or you can text FC Students to 24587. Since school has started back up, we are resuming our ministry of lunch buddies. This is a great opportunity for you to invest in a child's life outside of church. You can find out more information about how to get involved at our Connect Center or on our website at foundationschurch.tv slash lunchbuddies. If you're a first time guest, we would love to meet and connect with you. You can fill out a Connect card in the seat in front of you and take it to our Connect Center after service. If this is your first time with us today, I just want to say welcome. I kind of am nervous because I feel like I'm teeing off after Tiger Woods because of how awesome Justin is. But we are in a series, you're in a series called Toxic. And I believe the first week was about, somebody tell me, what was the first week? Toxic what? Friendships. And then last week was toxic unforgiveness. Very good. Well, today we are going to talk about toxic distractions. All right? Toxic distractions. But because I'm here and your pastor always has incredible sermon titles. Um, for instance, he came and spoke to our youth group one time, and his title of his sermon was Oreos and Strippers. <laughs> and so um, <laughs> one of our junior high kids said, I love both of them. <laughs> I, was like, okay. um, <laughs> I was like, stick Oreos. But because I'm here today, the title of my sermon is Crockpots, Top Tens, and Cell Phones. All right? So Crockpots, Top Tens, and Cell Phones. We're talking about toxic distraction. How many here are busy. If you're, if, if you're busy, life is busy. Life is busy for me. I have my my wife. I have, is the love of my life. I've been married for 14 years, and I have a, a little boy named Cooper. He's he went for round two in children's church back there. He is excited, and so love love Pastor Sammy. My son Cooper is eight. My little demon possessed daughter is four. And so the other day I asked her what her name was, and she said Legion. And so I'm a little nervous. If you know that story from the Bible, not really. Um, but anyways, I. Uh, she, anyway, she is fun. And so, and so life is busy. And you know how it is. You have school and work and I have to go get my hair done and all those different things. And, and we got gymnastics and wrestling and baseball and football. And you got to watch OU and you got to pray for OSU and all these things that are, that are going on. And so last Sunday night, you ever have like little family powwows? Like, all right, Sunday night, like this is an important meeting. Let's go to 7-Eleven and get Dr. Pepper and so we can have this meeting. Actually, I took a trip today. You know, there's no, there's no quick trip in, in Oklahoma City. And so I came here to the promised land, and I'm able to get Dr. Pepper tastes better from quick trip. I don't know what it is. So anyways, I uh, so we sat down on Sunday night, and my wife was like, this is a busy week. She's like, Tuesday night wrestling. Monday night, Cooper has a flag football game. We're like in between, like flag football is almost over. And then we're going into wrestling. So we've got Monday night flag football game, Tuesday night's wrestling, Wednesday night's church, Thursday night's flag football game. I don't think we're doing anything Friday night. I'm like, oh, yeah, Friday night is uh, it's youth season uh, for hunting. And so me and my son have been hunting. We haven't seen anything. I shot a cow last night. <laughs> um, I got a two-pointer. <laughs> and so anyways, um, cows are easier to shoot. They stand there and look at you. And, and anyways, not really. I did not shoot a cow. Some of you are mad at me. All right, so anyways, I did not shoot a cow, although I'm thinking about it if I don't start seeing deer. And so... So we had something every single night of the week, and so my wife was like, okay, then if we're going to eat dinner tomorrow night, which I think eating dinner is good, um, and we try to eat dinner at least four or five times a week as a family, three to four, and, and so I'm, she's like, if we're going to eat dinner as a family, I'm going to need your help. She's like, it all depends on you, and she's looking at me, and I'm like, oh my gosh, all right? This is what it looks like. This must be what it feels like when, when Lincoln Riley is talking to Jalen Hurts. I'm not going to let you down, coach, or when Mike Gundy is talking to... There, he doesn't say that because Spencer Sanders lets him. Anyways, um, and so, and so I'm like, 
all right, babe. And so the next morning, I wake up, the alarm goes off. I go work out, come home. My wife's working out. I'm in the shower. She's like, okay, Ryan, I, I have, I'm going to do a dinner in the crock pot. You have to, the game's at, uh, at 7.30, got to be there at 6.30. That means you need to leave at 6 because this is important stuff. This is eight-year-old flag football. We got to get there, get warmed up, intimidate the other team, that kind of stuff, right? Work on our taunting, make fun of their moms, different things like that. And so, and so <laughs> and we're, sorry if that offended you, and so we're, we're, we got to get ready to go. And so that means we need to be sitting down to eat dinner at 5.30. So when I get home, I'm going to go to, okay, all right. She's like, so it's going to be in the crock pot. Here in just a minute, before I leave, I'm going to give you the directions. So I get out. My son's eating breakfast. We're sitting there. We're doing our thing. My phone starts ringing. Several of our pastors were out of town. And so there was people who were in the hospital. And so that week, everybody at our church got sick. And so there was a lot of hospitals. And so my wife comes in right before they leave. And she's giving me the directions for the crock pot. But the problem is, is while she's talking to me about the crock pot, two things are going on. I'm on my cell phone, and I'm also watching the top 10 on ESPN. That is what me and my son do. We watch the top 10 ESPN because that's what you do when you're a guy, right? You eat bacon and sausage in the morning, and you watch ESPN. So she's like, did you get my instructions? you understand it? And in my mind, I'm like, it's a crock pot. It's not that hard, all right? The first time I screwed it up because I turned it on, but I didn't plug it in, all right? That's important to plug in. Um, and so um, my wife, I said, all you said to do was turn it on. She's like, no, you have to plug it in too. I was like, sorry. And so um, I was like, I got this, all right? I, I, I got this. And so I wasn't, I'm going to tell you, I wasn't really listening to her about the crock pot because I was distracted by the top 10 in my cell phone, crock pots, cell phones, and top 10s. And so I'm sitting there. And so she leaves, and I set an alarm for noon to come home. She said, at noon, I need you to come home. And she said, I need you to put it on low. And I didn't hear that, or I, I heard it, but I wasn't listening. Man, you know the difference when you hear things, but you're not listening, all right, and so that happens to us sometimes. I can remember every single number of every guy I played against in football in high school and in college, but I can't remember, like, the crockpot stuff, and so I am doing hospital calls throughout the day, and about noon, my phone, my alarm goes off, and I'm like, that's weird. I wonder what that's for. I don't ever wake up at noon, all right, and so I'm driving around town. That's weird, and so I'm listening to Sports Animal and all that kind of stuff, and I'm driving around doing my hospitals, praying, because you, I'm, I'm just going to confess, you want to get there quick, because you don't want them to die before you get there, so you're going to pray for them, right? And so, so we're driving around, and, and we're, <laughs> I'm just, just being honest with you today, all right? And so, and so you're driving around, and I get there, and so I go home, because I'm going to run in and eat really quick, eat lunch at home, because go Dave Ramsey, and so we're saving money, and so I'm going to run in, get my stuff, go back home, and when I run in, have you ever had an oh crap moment? I'm sorry, we're in church. Have you ever had an, oh, bless me, Jesus, help me moment, all right? And so I walk in, and the reason why I had that moment was because I saw the crock pot. And I was like, oh, man, what do I do? And I walk over, and the, and the bad thing about it is, is there was more options than I remembered the last time. <laughs> there was warm, there was low, there was medium, and there was high. I, didn't, I needed help, because I didn't want to text my wife, because then I would be outed. So I'm like, God, help me. I'm singing Ocean Spirit, where my, you know, lead me where my... Faith was without borders and help me and stuff like that. And so I'm like, to me, I'm an hour and a half late, so high seems like the best option. All right? Because we're already late, we got to eat. You don't want it to be, I mean, chicken's got to be whatever was in there, okay? It was really good. And so my, my wife texts me a little bit later, hey, did you remember to turn the crock pot on? Yes. I hope you did put it on medium, right? Because if you put it on high, it will burn it. But if you put it on medium, even if it's a little bit late, it's going to be fine. Yes, babe, right? And she gets home, all right? How many of you guys know? My parents are here today, right? I never got away with anything. I love my parents to death. I never got away with anything. My wife's the same way. You don't get away with anything, guys, right? You, you just don't. And she calls me. Why is it on high? Luckily, the Lord is faithful, and it worked out, and we ate dinner, and we're still alive today. But as I was sitting there thinking about that, I'm sitting here, here's the most important woman in my life talking to me about one of the most important things I do in my life, which is eat dinner together as a family. If you don't believe that, go research, go do research and, and look up the importance of eating din dinner together as a family and what it can do for your kids. I'm not joking, I'm saying the truth. And, it, and I'm listening to the most important person and I'm not listening over one of the most important things. And why was that? It's because I was distracted. I was distracted. Distraction comes from a Latin term which means to pull apart or to separate. And a long time ago, back in the medieval days, the, the, the French developed this term or, or this form of torture called distraction. And literally what they would do is they would take four horses, they would tie a guy to it, and they would put a rope to it, and they would literally pull him apart. So literally, just a second, I need to get a drink. I sounded like one of my seventh grade girls, literally. All right, um, and so they're pulling the people apart and they're distracted. How many of you feel like this in life? You're just being pulled apart. You're busy, right? 
you got gymnastics and soccer and baseball and softball and all of those things. And for many of us this morning, I believe that's what we feel like emotionally. Perhaps that's what we feel like mentally. And if I was a betting man, which I'm not because I never win, but if I was a betting man, I would say that there's probably a lot of you in here, and if you were honest with yourself, that's exactly what you feel like spiritually. You're like, it's just been a long time since I actually got in front of Jesus and I wasn't distracted. Distraction does three things. It keeps us away from people. It keeps us away from our work. And what I have found, <coughs> and if you're honest, you probably will too, distraction keeps us from God. I don't know if you know this or not, but the devil doesn't need to destroy you if he can distract you. He does not need to destroy you if he can distract you. Proverbs 14, 12 says this, there is a way that appears to be right, but in the end it leads to death. As people, we're really bad about thinking we can do things on our own. Oh, it seems like it's right. If it feels good, do it. And what happens is Satan wants to do everything he can to distract you so that you can go on and do things on your own. A couple weeks ago in our youth ministry, we had a young man. We, every fall we have a night called homecoming. And we dress up and have food and all that kind of stuff. And, and the, the, uh, the drum line was there. And we had this kid who came back. Usually it's a really cool story of somebody who grew up in our youth group. I've been there for 13 years, and so now I've seen a lot of things. And this was a young man who stopped coming to our church when he was in ninth grade. Today he's 23. A year ago, September... He was driving down the road in Midwest City, Oklahoma. He was drunk, and he hit a lady going 83 miles an hour, and it killed her. And as he sat on our platform in our youth building, he was able to point out, it was right over here, he was able to point out the exact chair that he sat in every time he came to church in 6th grade, 7th grade, in 8th grade, and a little bit in 9th grade, and then he left. He sits there with an ankle monitor on his ankle because that's where they usually put an ankle monitor <laughs> on your ankle. And so he's sitting there and he can't go. In fact, one day he was going to rehab to therapy for his physical therapy. And his, him and his mom went through the Whataburger um, line and he actually got in trouble, had to go to prison for two weeks because he went through Whataburger. If he would have went through Chick-fil-A, the Lord would have delivered him. <laughs> but he's sitting there and you know what he said? He said, I'm closer to God than I've ever been now. What do you have to go through for God to get you out of your distractions so you can get close to him. Because I think the reason why Satan would just assume distract us is because in that moment when he tried to destroy that young man, all of a sudden you come face to face in life. You guys know there's not a lot of atheists in math class when you haven't studied, right? When you're in the middle of something and you're going through something, that's when you want to know Jesus. But can I ask you right now, are you distracted right now up front? And it, and it was really sad because I realized that's the reason why so many people, they're distracted because if, you, if, if Satan can simply distract you, then he can work in your lives and stay behind the scenes and you never, ever know it. Luke 10, 38 says this. I'm going to ask you to turn to two places, Luke 10 and 2 Samuel 11. And Luke 10, 38 says this. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted. Everybody say distracted. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha. So to kind of set the picture, Jesus is at their house. And so she, Martha's like, hey, we got to get things going. Quick, pick up everything, throw all the stuff in the closet, let's dust things. I need you to go Windex, the, Windex the, the, the mirrors. I need you to get everything good. Make sure you get up top. Okay, make sure that you can't see the stuff that you shoved underneath your bed. Okay, no crockpot dinners. We're going to cook good food. In fact, we're going to get out that china that's in that, like, that cabinet thing that we haven't used. We got it for, a honey, for our wedding. We've never used it. We're getting out the nice china. We're going to do all that stuff. And Martha's worried, and her sister is in there, and Jesus is at her house, and Martha is working, and Jesus is right there. Could you imagine if Jesus was at your house, would you have a few things you'd like to talk to him about? Every morning when you wake up, you have the opportunity to meet with Jesus. And how many of us are like Martha? We wake up, oh, we got so many things going on, and we don't take the time. Why? Because we're distracted. Anything that keeps you from Jesus is toxic. This series is toxic. Anything that keeps you from Jesus is toxic. And let me tell you, there's nothing wrong with what Martha was doing. It's great to eat. I love food, okay? It's great to eat. You need to clean up the house, all those things. But good things become toxic things when they keep you from the God things. Good things become toxic things when they keep you from the God things. So today I want you to think through that. Are you distracted? The first thing I want you to know today is this, is distraction is the enemy of discipleship. 
Distraction is the enemy of discipleship. John 10, 27 says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. You have to hear his voice. If my sheep hear my voice, how important is it to hear God's voice? No wonder Satan works so hard to distract us from spending time with Jesus and to distract us from hearing his voice. You have to hear, learn to hear his voice. The biggest um, thing I want for my children, my son Cooper, my daughter Ramsey, my biggest desire for them is to be able to hear God's voice. Parents, if you want your kids to hear God's voice, you've got to put them in an atmosphere and prioritize them being in the atmospheres in which they're going to hear from Jesus. In 2007, Steve Jobs walked out on a platform just like this, and he picked up one of these things, okay? Nobody knew what it was. It's your maps, your calendar, your phone, your camera, your wallet. Women can shop on here, guys. <laughs> All right, they, there lots, lots of, you can do everything on here. Your GPS, you can send each other money, you can message people, you can talk to somebody in China on this thing. FaceTime, everything else. Everything went into this one thing, and if we're not careful, this thing can become a WMD, a weapon of mass distraction. And in 12 years, the world has changed because of this. 53% of the millennials in Generation Z that were surveyed said they would rather lose their sense of smell than lose their smartphone. <laughs> Our cell phones today, this thing has 30 times the processing speed that the navig navigational computer had that guided Apollo 11 to the moon, and that computer was 70 pounds, and this right here has 30 times the processing power. The average American spends more than three hours a day on a smartphone, and most of that is dedicated to using uh, social media, messaging, and navigation. More than seven years of our lives will be spent on this. For teenagers, if you're a parent in here, listen to this. Teenagers spend about nine hours a day online. That ends up being 24 years of their life, scrolling, snapping, keeping that streak alive, DMing, Instagramming, adding to their story. There's a direct connection between screen time and depression and anxiety. If you were to study this generation of students today, depression and anxiety is one of the biggest things that comes up. I, I noticed this this morning. Uh, I have several of my friends, their son shot deer. Me and my son, we didn't shoot deer, right? Remember, we shoot cows, right? <laughs> we didn't shoot deer. And I showed my son, oh, look, so-and-so shot a deer, so-and-so. And it's like, oh, right? Because that's what happens. Oh, they're on vacation. It's fall break and they're in Florida. That's awesome. I'm at church. Yeah. Bless them, right? <laughs> Jesus, right? Seriously, I have friends like that, like, oh, we went to Disney World, it's awesome, your seventh time, like, we're trying to save up for the first time. You know what I'm talking about? You get mad, right? That's what happens. You get distracted. Last night, I was running through Wendy's to get something to eat. I look on here, I'm waiting in line, and one of my friends was on a date with his wife, all right? He said, here's my dinner, green salad with raspberry, chipotle, balsamic vinaigrette dressing, wild rice with lemon garlic and pine nuts, apple brined oven roasted pork chop with apple sauce. I'm having a Baconator, all right? <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> I'm like, that's it. Give me two and a Frosty, all right? <laughs> Take a look at that on Facebook, brother, all right? But isn't that what social media does to us? It distracts us. You're sitting here, you can't even enjoy your Baconator now because they're having brine stuff, all right? <laughs> teen suicide has actually outpaced teen homicide. Why? Because we don't get together anymore. They don't, students don't get together. They're, they're more connected than ever, but they're more isolated than ever. In, in a study in Canada, there was 3,826 high school kids that were studied over four years, and researchers found that each hour of screen time, whether it be spent on social media, watching television, or just on the internet, increased the severity of depressive symptoms like loneliness, sadness, hopelessness, and all those things are distractions that keep us away from... God's word. We'd rather TikTok than just talk. We'd rather Facebook than put our face in the book. You know what I'm talking about? 71% of people sleep with their phones next to them. You're six times more likely to get in a car accident because of your tweeting than you are drunk driving. You're more likely to die taking a selfie than from a shark attack. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so what's the big deal the big deal is distraction 
73% of people, when they wake up, they check their social media before they do anything meaningful to engage in spiritual activity with Jesus. I wonder if that's why, just talking about distraction, I wonder if that's why, like, any of you have, like, a crazy uncle that's been in prison? You know, you go visit them, maybe a crazy aunt, I don't know, uh, maybe two, three. And so you, um, as a youth pastor, I've learned that apples don't fall far from the tree and neither do nuts, (laughs) all right? So um, (laughs) you go and when you go to prison and you go visit somebody in prison, what do you do? You have to, when you talk to them, you go and you sit and you talk to them through glass, right? You talk to them, you have that, sometimes you can talk, sometimes you have to pick up a phone, but you talk to them through glass. They leave their cell and they come out and they talk through glass. Today, we don't talk to people, we talk through glass. I wonder if this is why these are called cell phones. Because what these do is these keep us from spending time with Jesus. The other day, we were hunting yesterday, deer hunting, before we had turned into cow hunting, and I was on my phone. Cooper said, Dad, why are you on your phone so much? Today, driving down here, I, I, uh, was driving down here, and, and all we did, we sat there and we just talked. I thought he was going to be asleep, but no. We, we discussed for about an hour and a half the significance of fog because it was foggy. Where does it come from? I don't know. I just started making stuff up. <laughs> I don't know. But you know how awesome that conversation was? He said, what are you talking about today, Dad? I'm talking about distractions. He said, why when I get up to battery, you always on your phone? I said, but I'm not on my phone. I'm, I'm keeping up on Game Changer, how many apps there are, how many pitches there are. But in his mind, I'm on my phone. I'm not paying attention to him. I'm, I'm video- Sometimes we spend so much time trying to capture the moment that we miss the moment. That'll preach. And by the way, I have had to repent and go through all of this stuff before I preach it to you. I've already preached it to myself. So I've already answered the altar call, okay? Distraction is the enemy of discipleship. If you're going to diminish distractions, you have to do two things. The first thing is this. You have to identify your distractions. Ask your spouse if you're married. What are my distractions? Kids, ask your parents. Parents, talk to your kids about it. Identify your distractions. It could be phones. It could be people. It could be relationships. What I've learned going through this is my biggest distraction is things that I cannot control. There are things in life that I cannot control, and I let them distract me. But what happens is I let the things that I cannot control get in the way of the things that I can control. And when I should be spending time in God's word, praying to the person who controls everything, I get distracted. And I let the things I can't control get in the way of the things that I can control. Identify your distractions. The second thing is this. You have to treat your distractions like sin. Why? Because anything that gets in between you and Jesus is toxic. Proverbs 5, 8 is, is a story in Proverbs 5 of a, of, a son, of, a, of a father with wisdom talking to his son. And he's warning his son about the adulterous woman. And in Proverbs 5, 8 it says, stay away from her. Don't go near the door of her house. Can I encourage you today to start treating your distractions the same way? Because a good thing becomes a bad thing when it keeps us from the best thing. The second thing is this. Prioritize what's important. The word prioritize, the root word is what? Prior. Prior. Proverbs 4, 25 through 27 in the passage translation says this. Set your gaze on the path before you with fixed purpose looking straight ahead. Ignore life's distractions. Easier said than done. Watch where you're going. Stick to the path of truth, and the road will be safe and smooth before you. Don't allow yourself to be sidetracked for even a moment or take the detour that leads to darkness. What we don't realize when we're distracted is how many times that detour ends up leading us to darkness. We're going to see that at the end today. Then Matthew 6, says this, But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you as well. How many times, though, do we end up seeking all the things before we seek the first thing? Prioritize. Priority. First. If you're going to get rid of distractions, you have to make sure you have priorities. I love this quote. In the absence of priorities, pettiness prevails. Pettiness, things that don't matter. What are your priorities? In Ephesians 5 and 6, if you, if you get bored today, or not, not even if you're bored, go home at halftime of the game, read Ephesians 5 and 6. When you, through, when you read through that, the first part of Ephesians 5, 1 through 21, it talks about our relationship with God, priority number one. Then it talks about our relationship with our spouse, priority number two, not baseball, softball, gymnastics. I've met a lot of parents who when their kids graduate from high school they don't know each other anymore because they've never made themselves a priority the best thing you can do for your kids is to show them what a marriage looks like the best thing that you can do so after god it's your spouse in ephesians 6 it starts talking about our children then our employer there's your priorities there's your priorities right there that is what i'm going to prioritize in my life because in the absence of priorities pettiness prevails the third thing is this, I want to encourage you today, if you're, going to, if you're going to not have toxic distractions in your life, 
You need to learn how to listen to the voice of God. Distraction is the enemy of discipleship. Listen to what Jesus says in John 10. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. How does all that happen? My sheep listen to my voice. Do you know how many times I've had a student walk up to me, Ryan, I don't understand why this happened. I don't understand why I'm going through this. Just, just two weeks ago, there was a girl that came up talking to my wife and, and I. My wife's like, how are you doing? She's like, I cry all the time. There was another girl, yeah, I just can't believe it. Like, that guy's here. He's here. We broke up six months ago. He's still bothering me. I just don't understand. Why we go, let me go through this? And my wife said, why are you blaming this on God? Like, you didn't ask him about dating him in the first place, so why are you complaining about what he's doing now? Like, how is it fair when you don't invite God in at the front end? How is it fair to blame him for what you're going through on the back end? Does that make sense? I think sometimes Satan gets too much credit and God gets too much blame. Satan's like, I didn't do that, dude. You did that. <laughs> and God's like, you know, you might not be going through this if you would have taken the time to listen to me. If you would have taken the time to listen to me. When I was five years old, I was outside with my dad and I cut my thumb. I was carving a pumpkin and ended up carving my thumb. The other day, my son and I, Cooper, we were out uh, on, working on getting all the deer feeders and everything ready, and he had a pocket knife. I said, Cooper, listen to me. <laughs> I love you, but this pocket knife, can I, yes, you can have it, but don't, don't cut yourself. And I showed him the scar. Be careful, okay? Five minutes later, hey, Dad, I think I cut myself. <laughs> Blood all the way down. I'm like, that's great. Now I'm going to get cut by your mom because I let you cut yourself, right? <laughs> My wife grew up in Hobbs, all right, Hobbs, New Mexico, was a gangster out there, and so she's the only blonde girl I know in a gang, but anyway, and so, uh, I'm not joking, <laughs> and so um, he's sitting there, and, and, and we had this, he's like, Dad, are you mad at me? No, so I'm not mad at you, but listen to me, son, am I for you, or am I against you? You're for me, okay. I was trying to keep this from happening. Listen, it's the same thing, and, and as I'm sitting here, telling my son, son, just listen to your father. If you would just listen to your father, I feel like God's in heaven, so mm, this is fun. <laughs> Why don't you keep preaching to your son? You ever been talking to your kids about something and you're like, my parents used to say this, and you feel like it's like God saying it to you? Son, just listen to me. And I feel like sometimes Heavenly Father, our, our Heavenly Father is in heaven saying, son, daughter, just listen to me. Just listen to me. I know you want to date her, but don't date her. You don't know the cray-cray that's in the family, all right? Just don't. God's up here in heaven saying, hey, I just want to listen to you. I just want to talk to you. But distractions keep us from it. How does God speak to us? First thing is this, through his word. And I'm almost finished. His word. This is what it says in 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what's right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. Why are we not prepared? Why are we not equipped? Why do we not know what's wrong in our lives? Why do we not allow correction in our life? It's because we're not in God's word. I believe that 95% of the things you need to know about life are right here. If the Bible's clear about it, you don't have to pray about it. Right here. God is like, I'm speaking to you through my word. The second way, this is one of the biggest ways that God speaks through peace. For those other 5% when you don't know what to do, Colossians 3.15 says, and let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. Let the peace, the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. That word rule in the Greek is the same word that we use for umpires. What do umpires do in a baseball game, all right? Umpires are not just there for grandmas and moms to yell at when their kids strike out, all right? Umpires are there to do what? They call balls and strikes. They call safe, out, fair, foul. That's what an umpire is there to do. And that's what the Holy Spirit wants to do in our life. He wants to speak to us. He wants to have a relationship with us. But we're too distracted. What does he want to do? Let, to let the peace of Christ, when you're walking through your life, do I make this decision? Do I not? Do I take the job? Do I not? Do I do this? Do I date her? Do I do this? Do I marry him? To let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. Let the peace of Christ call the balls and strikes, the safe and out. That's foul. <laughs> that's what the Holy Spirit wants to do in your life. Colossians 3.15, let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. The next way that he speaks to us is this, people. It says this in Proverbs 12, 15, the way of fools seems right to them, but the wise listen to advice. You know how many times I could have avoided things in life if I just would have listened to my parents, all right? They're here today, they didn't pay me to say that, but, you know, listen to advice. My grandma, she was another one. Oh Lord, like, I swear God has a cell phone and my grandma has the number, right? 
Then there was another lady at church. I grew up at Tulsa Carbondale. There was a little lady named Sister McQueen. She's the one that always gives the interpretations when there's a message in tongues. You don't, I'm like, oh, great. When she would come walking to me, I'm like, oh, great. God told her something, right? <laughs> and these are people in my life. The other day I was reading through something in, in Proverbs, and, and I highlighted it on my phone. And, and my Pastor Robbie McClure, my boss, I have the honor to work for him and Pastor McNabb, great people. He said some things, and it confirmed that. It, it, it was something I read and I highlighted, and God spoke through it. Who are the people in your life that you listen to? you listen to the next one is a still small voice just sometimes when you hear you just god's talking to you in a still small voice all right if he's telling you to run over the lady in front of you that's going really slow in the right lane that's probably not that's the spirit it's just not the holy spirit right but but by the way if you drive slow in the left lane never mind all right but there's that still small voice where he's whispering to you he's talking to you dreams and visions god can speak through dreams and visions it talks about that in joel too and I believe that God speaks to us through circumstances. But my question for you today is this. Are distractions getting in the way of your discipleship? Are distractions getting in the way of your discipleship? I believe this. We're going to end in 2 Samuel chapter 11. But I, I, I believe this. That if you live a distracted life, if you are distracted, the Bible says you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. But if you're distracted, students, if you're distracted, then what's going to happen is you will move to deception. You will move to doing things and saying things and going places and doing things that you normally wouldn't have done, if you, but you're so distracted from the truth that you're easily deceived. If you don't know God's word and anything sounds good, so you move from distraction to deception, and then that's when you move to destruction, when you're destroyed. In 2 Samuel chapter 11, there's a story of a man that is really, really famous. It's a man named David. And if you know David, he was really famous for doing what? He killed Goliath. It's probably one of the first stories that you ever hear um, in Sunday school. So David, David kills Goliath. He's, he's anointed king. In, in the Bible, it even says that, that David is a man who is after God's own heart. But one day he got distracted. This is what it says. And I believe Derek and the team's going to come up here to help us finish. It says this in 2 Samuel chapter 11. In the spring of the year, when kings normally go out to war, that's important, normally go out to war. But he wasn't at war. Why? Because he was distracted. In the spring of the year, when kings normally go out to war, David sent Joab and the Israelite army to fight the Ammonites. They destroyed the Ammonite army, and they laid siege to the city of Rabbah. However, David stayed behind in Jerusalem. David was supposed to be out here fighting. He was supposed to be doing what he was supposed to be doing, but he wasn't. And he ends up getting distracted. So David stayed behind late one afternoon after his, mid, his midday rest. David got out of bed and was walking on the roof of the palace. Now I want you to kind of think about this for just a moment. This was a moment when he was alone. It's, it's kind of an intimate moment. He just got up from sleeping. He, he's, he, he just, he's all alone, just got up sleeping. What's he doing? It says that he got out of bed and was walking on the roof of the palace. And as he looked out over the city, he noticed a woman. So now he's not where he's supposed to be. He's distracted from doing his job. He's distracted from being the dad he's supposed to be. He's distracted from doing the work he's supposed to do. So he's just distracted. Can you give me some David and Bathsheba music? Okay. I didn't know what it sounded like. <laughs> and, and so he's up there, and, and he's, he's on the roof walking around, and this is what it says. He noticed a woman of unusual beauty taking a bath. Isn't, it how, isn't that how Satan works? When you're somewhere you're not supposed to be, or when you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing, you end up seeing things that you normally wouldn't see. And when you're distracted, you, you go places you shouldn't go, or you don't go places you should go. You see things you shouldn't see. And what happens, he's about to move from distraction to deception. Man, that sounded like my mom. All right. So he noticed a woman of unusual beauty taking a bath. That's not good. He sent someone to find out who she was. Now let me put this how it is today. So students, um, you're like, hey, I didn't mean to see that. I was watching you. It just came up on the recommended on the side. I was scrolling through. I, didn't, I, was, I was on the roof walking around. I didn't mean, I'm not even friends with her. It just came up on the explore part, Right? Maybe for some of the guys, I, I didn't, it was just, it's an old friend, I popped up, mutual friends, and, 
And today, we don't send a messenger. We DM, we message, we tweet, we, we text. So we sent someone to find out who she was, and he was told she is Bathsheba, which is always funny to me because she's taking a bath. Her name is Bathsheba. The daughter of, <laughs> the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah, the Hittite. Okay, she's married, dude. But you're distracted. Now you're deceived. Then David sent messengers to get her, and she came to the palace, and he slept with her. She had just, um, verse 5, later when Bathsheba discovered that she was pregnant, she sent David a message, and this is a text message you don't want to get from somebody else's wife. I'm pregnant. <laughs> You're the dad. So David had the spiritual gift in this moment of his solution was worse than his problem. You ever been there? His solution was worse than his problem. So what does he do? Now he's gone from distraction now he's gone to deception. Now he's getting ready to go to destruction and go home. Read the, read the story as a family. What ends up happening? He ends up killing Uriah, Bathsheba's husband. So let's think about that. Distraction on the roof, sleeping with a girl. She gets pregnant, and now it's destruction. Why is all of that? It's because distraction is the enemy of discipleship. Can you imagine what would happen in this, in this place if all the men and all the young men and all the dads, I just want to remember, if you got on fire for God and you said, I'm not going to get distracted? It's amazing to me that the time when David sees Bathsheba, he had just woken up, he's alone, he's in his room. Those are the three components for an incredible quiet time with Jesus, right? But what happened? Satan's going to do everything he can to distract you. I, I, would, I, would, I would almost suggest this, that I think in all of our lives, the moments that are the, the best times to spend with Jesus are the moments when Satan tempts us the most. Why? Because he knows what happens when you get into this book, and he knows what happens when Jesus' sheep hear his voice. Distraction is the enemy of discipleship. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Today, can I encourage you to this? Foundations Church, can we choose what's better? I'm not saying we need to collect all of our cell phones and throw them away and burn them. If you're going to do that, let me have them. I'll sell them. I'll give half back to Foundations Church, but I'll keep the other half, all right? I'm not saying that. I'm not saying go home and get off all everything, although I'm, my personal self, I'm kind of considering just taking a month or so off of social media. I'm not saying any of that stuff. I'm asking the question, what is it that distracts you? What are you distracted by? What is keeping you from Jesus? Let me ask you this, when and where do you meet with Jesus? Non-negotiable, every day, this is when I meet with Jesus. I'm going to ask everyone in here to stand. Put your phones up. I'm going to ask everyone to stand. I'm going to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes. If you're in here today and you say, Ryan, and also I'm going to ask our prayer team to come forward. If you're part of the prayer team here at Foundation Church, I'm going to ask you to come forward at this time. If you're in here today and you say, Ryan, I have been very, very, very distracted. I don't even realize it until I sit down and I'm afraid that if I'm not careful, I'm going to go from distraction to deception to destruction. And I've never asked Jesus Christ to be the Lord of my life. I don't hear his voice. I want to hear his voice. But if you're in here today and you say, Ryan, I want to give my heart and life to Jesus. Would you raise your hand right where you're at? Is there anybody in here? Raise your hand real high if that's you. I'm not going to embarrass you, ask you to come up front. Okay, good. Then that means that we're all going to heaven. So here's my next question for you while your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed. We're going to take a few moments here, and Derek's going to sing through this song. And this is what I want you to ask Jesus. I want you to ask Jesus this question. Jesus, what is it that's distracting me? I want to hear your voice, but I can't because I'm distracted. Jesus, what is it? What is it that's distracting me? And Jesus, what is it that I need to do to get those distractions out of my life?